Welcome to today's interview. I brought on Kai Harris. Kai, welcome. Hello, Heather. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Another fellow Aussies. The last interview I did was another Aussie, and I love Aussies. So for those that aren't familiar, for those that don't know you, where do you live and what do you do? I'm on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, which is a beautiful beachside city. I believe we've got about 350,000 people in the area, so we're not small. We're not huge either, but beautiful spot. Uh, What I do, I'm a uh, as far as work, I'm a director and advice a financial advisor with our own company called Perrin Financial Group. I'm doing financial advice for over 20 years now. So the foundations of uh, where I'm at and what I talk to people about and what I speak to are uh, discovering truths around success and money, uh, beliefs around money, because they, yeah, they're pretty tough and it's a hard struggle for just about anybody. Lots of money or no money. Money plays a big role. So which I speak to a lot about human behavior how we can actually identify our values and what's important in our life rather than trying to detach from money as a rule of what we do and how it dictates what we do in life. Oh, there's so much. And the reason we connected, <laughs> I got to be on your podcast last week. So I'm very grateful for that Good. connection. It was but an let's, excellent chat. Thank you. Yes. There's so much to talk about and I want to make sure we cover as much as we can. So let's start at the top because I think it's something very relatable. And especially since this is what you do for a living, can we talk about money? Debunk yeah. <laughs> some money struggles, that fear, <laughs> scarcity, because I feel like most of society lives in struggle financially. Yeah, absolutely. And it really is a mindset thing. And I, I will be clear there too. It's not just about changing how you think and then you'll be rich. It's not what it's about. It's actually just about identifying what it is you really want. So what people do when they first come to see me and have done all my career is it okay we've got this money or we've got so far we're not sure what to do or we're not sure what else to do what should we do with our money so they're always basically looking for making more money at least on the surface once I dig what they're actually after and this is something that it's it's not a new concept and it's spoken about a few different uh, teachers and speakers out there is that they're wanting the feeling that they'll think they'll have in having more money and those feelings are ones of security, namely security or freedom. They're probably the two biggest ones. And one of the biggest challenges as to why we've actually got that is because we can't, it's our conditioning, it's our environment. If you think back, and this is where it all sort of starts to, to change or when you want to start changing your beliefs around money, think back to what your upbringing was like. Now, <laughs> I don't want you to go back and start blaming mum and dad and burning them at the stake, but it's just to create awareness of what was actually going on for you. Now, what I've seen a lot of is scarcity and shortage and this philosophy around living, which is get a sort of good education or get yourself into a good job to earn a decent pay and stand on your own two feet, buy a house and have a family. That's kind of the model of good living and you have holidays and those sorts of things, but school, uh, parents and all our influences, our environment as we're growing up, don't actually teach us about money. Money is no different to any tool that you would use. And one example I've used is that it's nothing like, it's just like a shovel. You don't have an emotional connection to your shovel. Yeah. But we've got such an emotional connection to money because that's what we're taught. Our lives are virtually dependent on it. Our quality of life depends on the amount of money you have. But that's simply not true. So it's it's really any wonder that uh, we do have such an emotional charge around money because it's ingrained in every single thing we do. Even if you plan a day out with your family, you're thinking about how much money you should spend on the food in the picnic or where you're going or when you go for a holiday, how much should you spend? There's always a budget. And awareness is great. You can't spend more than you earn, but it's the emotions behind it that are really... Uh, causing havoc with just about everyone. So awareness of those, and then it's attached to beliefs and start changing that. That's where it kind of all stems from. That's the foundation. I want to share just a couple of things because I've done um, definitely some work around money mindset. And I, I don't think I really experienced it until I left corporate to really understand my conditioning. But here's some fundamental things I learned growing up. And I'm not saying these are bad, but they're limiting. So for example, that you have to work to earn money. And so with that kind of conditioning and all my years in jobs, 
I, you know, we believe money page, it comes through a paycheck through a job. And so yeah. to go from a job environment to working on my own, that's a shift in itself, but also growing up, you know, um, maybe you got paid when you did chores or that you have to save up for something. So a lot of, or if you're told no, then the whole worthiness comes in. And so there's just so much, we're going to use it because yeah. we've already said it behind the scenes, but there's so much mental fuckery <laughs> in like the stories we play. And in, you're right. Yeah. I feel like awareness is key. And if you don't become aware of those beliefs and the limitations, the lack, the scarcity, I'm, you know, holding my knuckles tight, like white knuckling. If you don't become aware of that, then you can't open yourself up to that freedom and security that you seek. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with everything you're saying. Humility is a, is a big place to start. So humility and accountability, you'll mm -hmm. turn the mirror within, look within yourself to see what's going on. So you can't blame your boss. You can't blame the economy. And you can't blame the person next to you or the person you're working next to is getting promotion. You're not because they're kissing ass better than you are. That's not actually what it's about. And yeah. you touched on one particular point there, which is our sense of self-worth, our own value. Now I've noticed this a lot in my time, particularly in colleagues in the line of work that I'm in, what they charge people to help them. And they're so reluctant to charge what they are truly worth, mm. but their sense of their own value doesn't, aligned to that higher charge so they're actually undercharging that's because they undervalue themselves so money is really the financial circumstances that any person is in is really just a reflection of a sense of your own value and your own worth so if you feel you're only worth a certain amount then that's all you will ever receive in your life so that's why turn the lens back in it's not blaming money the awareness of money is simply just three rules spend less than you earn invest the difference and just keep doing it. That's kind of the three basic rules. It's not that complicated, but we right. overcomplicate it because we're compensating with money. We're not fulfilled. We're not satisfied. We don't feel a sense of worth or value. So we try and fill ourselves up by buying things and a bigger yeah. house or a bigger car or a new car and those sorts of things. So it's a, it's a basically like a drug. We've got this huge addiction to money in one form or another. And again, what we're looking for is the feeling we think we will get in having more of it which is security and freedom. But those feelings are available any one time. And one of the great examples of that is imagine yourself for a moment. This is an old one too, sucking on a lemon. And you close your eyes, you get yourself into that state where you feel you really, you've got a lemon and you're, you're, you're biting into it. Your brain will start to create a physiological reaction. It's like you're, you're actually licking or biting that lemon. So this is what happens when we imagine ourselves, if we want to imagine freedom, we can actually get ourselves there and get that feeling. No amount of money in the bank's ever going to work. That's why the wealthiest of the wealthiest will still commit suicide and be miserable. Those who are extremely poor materially, I'm speaking, are actually got big smiles on their faces and the happiest people in the world. Why is that? Certainly not money related, is it? It comes from within. So yeah, value is a big part there, recognize your own value and, and working on that. And it takes a lot of exploration. It takes a confronting of a lot of fears and traumas and past pains to reveal your personal truth, who you really are and what your, what your actual value is, which is extraordinary. We're all extraordinary valuable, but we just don't see it. A thought that came to me last night, I was listening to, I think like some audible book on YouTube, something about the millionaire mindsets by T yeah. Harv somebody. Yes. Yes. But something that came to mind when I was listening to it last night was we have tied our quote self-worth to our net worth. Yeah. You're not worth anything. You're not worth as much if you aren't worth as much. Which is silly. And then here's another one. Mm. So my mind was blown. And here's where I think perception comes in. And we're not just talking about money. Because next I want to talk about success and kind of your wake up call. But yeah. here's a perfect example of somebody's self-worth. A friend of mine just joined some female mastermind for 20 grand. So she bought into some program for $20,000. This woman that's running the program to work with her one-on-one -on -one, she charges $155,000 for a three month. And I don't know how many sessions that is, if it's mm -hmm. once a week, once a month. But anyway, look at the, this woman is charging 50 grand a month to work with her and people are paying it. 
So there's a value even in, you know, my industry coaching. If you think you're worth 50 grand a month, I know Tony Robbins, as an example, I'm pretty sure he charges like a million dollars for a one day session. Yeah. Okay. Even there, those people feel they provide that much value and that is their worth. And because they feel that within and exude that and embody that, they can attract people willing to pay that. 100% correct. And (sighs) one great exercise for any listeners to do, get a pen and paper. And this is one basic question. What's your number? So if you are in business or if you are in an employee arrangement, right pen to paper what you feel you're worth each year Uh and what you need to do here is you need to do a little bit of exploration it shouldn't take too long so you've got to be aware of that first the recognize that first feeling that you get when you write a number so if you write for example seventy thousand, how does that feel like oh i think i'm a bit underdone i think i'm worth more than that write the next higher number and then you'll recognize a point where you get to let's say 300,000, you go, oh, that starts to feel uncomfortable. I don't think I'm really worth that. That's exactly what you believe you're worth. Now, this is why you are, you are in the financial circumstances that you're in, anyone who's listening, myself included. It's a direct mirror of what you feel you're worth. So that lady charging 50 grand a month, she just wholly, sincerely, genuinely, and authentically believes in her worth. And she believes as far as getting remunerated for her value, that is the number. That's all it is. It's just a number. It's like numbers on a screen. It's, you yeah. can delete them. You can add zeros. You can do whatever you want with them. And it's all funny enough. And I remember this through my career, perception of value. If you portray yourself as being valuable, people will believe it. You're not necessarily, and I'm firsthand working with different companies and things over the years, they're not doing anything different to the other company that doesn't portray themselves, doesn't have the shiny things in their office as this one here. Yeah. Two companies side by side, one's charging double, if not triple, not doing anything different, not really saying anything different than the one that doesn't have the flashy office. See it all the time, all the time. It's just really what you believe you're worth. That's it, plain and simple. Well, you know, it just came to mind if we want to talk material objects, the difference between a Lamborghini and let's say like a Toyota Corolla, again, those are perceived values or like a yes. Louis Vuitton, any of those high-end brands, it's a purse, it's a car, it has four wheels, it gets you from A to B, but it's that perceived identity and value around it that they can charge what they charge. Yeah, absolutely. Dang. And I want to be, I think, important to add here too, that it's not, there's no virtue in being poor. So that's another belief that can creep in. It's virtuous to be poor and want for nothing. Now, as human beings, we're intrinsically wired. Our, our DNA is about evolvement and growth. And evolvement and growth, some of those luxuries come into play. But it really comes back to not chasing the Lamborghini over the Corolla unless that genuinely and authentically is your true purpose in life, is to do that, which is seldom you'll find anyone who really that is. Yeah. What it's about is about connecting with what is you really love doing. And what you will find is that what you really love doing and therefore being, then the money won't matter so much. You'll actually have those feelings of freedom and security and the money will actually just flow. So I don't know exactly, but I suspect maybe that the lady uh, charging $50,000 a month or even Tony Robbins, they're doing exactly what they believe they are here to do in their life before they leave the planet. They're living their purpose and therefore that value comes through in that because they're genuinely and authentically showing up with their whole soul and they're pouring everything in. They're giving you everything that yeah. they have to offer. So again, that's what they feel they're worth. But it's, um, yeah, incredible. Incredible the role it plays and awareness is the key. Yeah, and we could talk hours about money. So here's, <laughs> here's where else I want to go with, because you shared this with me. I would love for you to give more background that, you know, I think so many of us have experienced. I did myself when I finally quit corporate in 2017, we chased what we're conditioned to do, what we think will make us happy, climbing the corporate yeah. ladder, getting a bigger house, accolades, whatever it is. But you shared with me mm. that, you know, you chased that definition of success, but you weren't happy, you weren't fulfilled. No, not at all. And it was something that I've nicknamed goalitis. So I suffered from goalitis incredibly. Oh. 
Goal-itis. <laughs> He's saying goal-itis. Okay. Got it. <laughs> goal-itis. It's a virus. <laughs> yeah. Probably one of the worst ones in the world. But where it kind of it stems back to environment, childhood, and all those foundations because Dr. Bruce Lipton speaks to this, our last trimester of being in the womb up to age seven is I'm not sure the exact percentage, but it's somewhere, it's really high. It's like over 80% of our thought patterns there and neuro pathways and all that are formed. And we are, are kind of 80% of who we're going to be up to zero, up to seven. Beyond age seven to sort of 12, 13, we start sort of cultivating more of who we are actually going to become as adults. So for me, what I learned through my life is that and Tony Robbins is one of those, one of his things too, is one of our core needs as human beings is significance. Mm. Now, for me, in seeking significance, I got that through achieving. So whenever it was I was achieved, that's when I felt most seen and recognized. So that became something I attached to. And that was where the ego got created and latched onto it and gone, oh, this is cool. I'm feeling significant. I'm feeling great. And that just kept propelling through my early teens, late teens into adulthood. So the goal was to work hard. You touched on something similar before, work hard. And to what end? I don't know because my dad worked his absolute butt off, still is to this day, is not happy, still hasn't got a lot to show for it materially because we've all got the same hours in the day. Why does someone working 15 hours only have $1,000 a week versus someone has a million dollars a week? It's a difference. It's belief. So my belief was that I work hard and there's not really that much to show for it. And I got actually stuck in this cycle of challenge and struggle. That's what life was. It was challenge and struggle. So I believe this is how it works. And I got to a point of many years ago now where it was, it was really uh, common. It's a common thing from people. It's like almost a wake up one day going, this is absolutely ridiculous. No matter how hard I'm working, I'm getting tighter and tighter I don't feel I've got that much in me. I was only in my sort of mid thirties, late thirties. Something's got to change because whatever I do in these achievements, business, getting more clients in, building more money, having a bigger house, all those sorts of things, I still wasn't happy. So like, hang on a sec. I got told this is what you're going to do. This is what I believe you're going to do. How come it's not working? There must be something wrong with me. So then I went and sought out help, and that's just basically where I just just nudge the door open a little bit to have a peek what's behind this bullshit story of this is how you live a successful life. And I just nudged that door open a little bit. I saw what was behind that. And I just got absolutely enthralled by it and have been doing it ever since. And the joy and the freedom I feel now, irrespective of what I have financially is the most incredible feeling, the most separate feeling I've ever had in my whole life. Cause I had a, I had an incredibly tense relationship around money, incredibly tense. The amount of anxiety it used to cause me is just unfathomable. So that was my, I guess, in short, the trigger. It was just literally, there's nothing more to share around that. Just literally, I would just recognize the fact this isn't working. I'm freaking miserable. I've got to change something. And I did. And then it's just been, it's just happened organically. There's been struggles along the way as in what am I doing and is this working? How come it's not working? I was feeling better last month, but I'm not this month, yeah. but I kept going and it just keeps opening that door wider and wider. Now it's like big floodgates are open. It's from that little first nudge on the little door now to big floodgates of what's actually out there with when it comes to being happy, being joyful, regardless of what's in the bank or what's been achieved. This door metaphor, are you saying more or less like curiosity? Yeah. You know that old saying around keep knocking on doors, the right one will open. So if you, this is usually related to like a job opportunity. Keep knocking on the doors. There was, um, what's the lady's name that wrote the Harry Potter books? I can't remember. It's not her name my yet. jam, I don't know. No, I don't watch Harry Potter either, but um, she had 12 or 13 rejections or something like that before it got bought. So this is what I mean about knocking on doors and you've got to look. You've got to be aware of what's not working for you and look to change it. And that's simply just knocking on doors. I've had so many different people come through. Well, I've seen so many different people who practice different modalities, whether it be coaches or whether it be uh, people that practice neuro-linguistic programming or whether it be timeline therapies. And I've tested just about all of them to find out, okay, what's not serving me, what beliefs I hold, negative thinking patterns, all those sorts of things to now realizing, oh, 
I can actually just be. This is all actually taken care of. Just trust that everything is rolling out as it's supposed to be. And as, as I've opened up to allowing things to happen rather than trying to force, control, and push, which is what I was taught is kind of needed, work hard, push, push hard. It's not working. Yeah. Actually work even harder, even more, yeah. do a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Hustle and grind, make working. shit happen. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start working. Ah, uh, Well, yep, you must have to work a bit harder then. Change your direction a little bit, but sometimes it actually just is a point of just sitting back and going, letting it happen, just see what happens in. And, you know, this yeah. is a, probably the easiest way to explain it is that when we are stressed, the majority of us live stressed day in, day out, hour upon hour upon hour. When we are stressed, there's a, a Dr. Alan Watkins, he says that when we're stressed, effectively we, we give ourselves a DIY lobotomy anxious and so that part of our brain just shuts off it's part of our brain that has cognitive thinking and objective reasoning to you know objectively assess the situation so when we're stressed we're not seeing everything with clarity at all mm. so we're just tunnel vision go 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 we've got to work hard oh, we've got to get home we're going to do this we're going to do that when you actually step back and that simple practice of taking five deep belly filling breaths the clarity comes back mm. When that becomes more of a day-to-day -day, rather than a five-minute moment through a day, you start to see life more clearly and those doors just keep opening. It's amazing what happens. When you let go, it actually starts to work. It's counterintuitive yeah. to everything we've we've been taught. Well, and, and you gave me a little bit of chills there. The way I think of that is when you're in that stress state, first of all, you know how bad it feels. It's, it's tight. Oh, it's shit, anxious. Yeah. You feel stressed. And I think of it like static. So when we're in that stressed out fear, well, really it's all fear-based, but we're in mm. that fear-based, we're literally, as Dr. Joe Dispenza would call it, incoherent. We've created static. There's mm. no alignment. We're a mess. I think Buddha says something about when the mind is still, it's, um, man, I'm going to mess that up. But when it's turbulent, you can't see. No. So ultimately, I love how you shared that uh, breath work, power of the pause, stop, mm. take a break, What, like kill the momentum of that stress, yeah. that state and come back. Here's what I want to ask you. It is easy in this industry. I call it like um, self-help junkies. Yeah. People become addicted to going to courses and seminars and reading all the books and listening to all the content, taking it all in and not applying. Yes. But again, that's also a, a teaching that it's outside of you. What would you like to debunk with that? Uh, I agree. First of all, yes, it's, it's, it's a source of information. These books, seminars, conferences, et cetera, a source of information. And where people, I guess, struggle, I had this question come up the other day with a, uh, someone close to me. And I mentioned a few times to them, you have to put it into practice. Otherwise, you're just regurgitating what you've read. You're digging into that memory bank, which is called your brain, and you're just regurgitating data. That's it. It's not actually integrated. And... He never really said anything, but it's some months on and literally only a couple of weeks ago, he goes, what do you mean put it into practice? What does that actually mean? So he can articulate things similar to what we're talking about, but I know that he's simply just regurgitating intellect. That's it. Yeah. He hasn't put anything into practice and I can see it. I can see it in how he feels. I can see it how he responds in situations. I can see it in how he actually goes about daily life. And I can hear it in his comments about life in general and different things in different circumstances. Now, the question is, how do you actually put it into practice? Well, one example is exactly what I just said before. Breath work. Takes only a couple minutes a day, twice a day. Try on a quiet spot, deep breaths, belly filling deep breaths, and almost try and draw your breath up from your belly, your abdomen, right up into your brain. And you just feel the difference in clarity you have when you give yourself that time and this is why for example smokers are or part why partly why they're addicted to smoking it's not necessarily the nicotine it's actually they leave a situation you know you've heard one before oh, i've got to go have a cigarette they go outside and they're taking in deep breaths unfortunately their system's getting rooted up by the cigarette yeah. <laughs> and the smoke but the principle is there so how do you put it into practice well it's exactly that second of all what you actually read and learn, that's what you put into practice. So 
What's a good example? Tony Robbins, for example, one of his things he says is spend less than you earn, invest the difference. Practice it. Spend less than you earn. Actually do it in your day to day. Don't buy the coffee. Don't buy the sandwich and see what mounts up in your pay packet by the end of the week. Then invest it. Now, you can either invest it further in yourself, but what he's referring to is just based on money, invest it into something, a, a savings account or some shares or something like that. That's putting it into practice. So I'm absolutely a believer. And what I want to highlight here too, what to look out for, and you might experience this yourself, Heather, that there is a time where you, you do have to have a break or you need to step back from actually reading and learning because your greatest learning will come from within. If you're aware of yourself, what's going on for you, yeah. what feelings are coming about in different situations. So observe yourself, observe your own behavior, living life. What's going on for you? Understand your own feelings, understand your own thinking. That's putting it into practice. And I know myself over the years, and I've had this since I was a child. I've always put my hand up to admit to something because I remember <laughs> when we were kids, myself and brother got into mischief, my parents would just come straight to me and say, Kai, what happened? And I'd just tell them the truth. So I've always had that. And as an adult, that served me really well because now I'm turning that mirror again back on myself to call myself out on things that I'm not doing mm. or the way I'm thinking. Mm. We're very unkind to ourselves. If I've been unkind to someone, I've had a sharp tongue. I've got to stop and I go and go apologize to that person. I've got to reflect then on why I did that. What's coming up for me? What's triggering for me? Because... Yeah. And I'm throwing a lot out here. 99 times out of 100, any time we react to something, it's got nothing to do with the situation we're in or the people in it. It's all from within us and it's a problem that we've actually got. And those triggers are a gift. Yeah, learn from them. Yep. Guess what? So Peter Crone, I, I, I want to share something before we move on, but real quick on that note, Peter Crone, love this guy. He His quote is something to the effect of, people and circumstances come into our life to reveal where we're not healed yeah oh absolutely that's beautiful yeah so oh. ultimately what you're saying <laughs> is you're you have a lot of self-awareness and mm. self-accountability yeah and wow. i'm certainly you know we're all human and i don't have that down pat and perfect day in day out and i have my moments but importantly a mistake is once or twice three plus no, that becomes a choice, choice. and you're yeah. choosing to not change anything. Yeah. So there is a line yes. and there's a boundary. There's no longer a mistake here. Yes. You're just being lazy. And the choice is being lazy. Like I'm just going to rant at somebody because I feel like it. That's a choice. You're being lazy. Keep yourself more accountable to be a better human. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Like you said it earlier, I think we're off air. Nothing happens to you. It happens for you. And even on that note, I believe it all is happening through us. So for example, I'm just going to share, not details, but yeah, yeah. I, I kind of went through a little bit of a tornado shit storm in the last few days. And I'm like, how the hell, why would I have uh, created this? What is this to teach me? I'm pissed off. I have, <laughs> it has to do with Airbnb. I had a horrible guest with 100% false accusations. But here I am playing victim and I know better. So it's like, mm. okay, I do not know what any of this is for. And one of my girlfriends reminded me, she's like, Heather, I don't know what, but something good will come from this. Mm. But again, it's having those people in your environment, right? To kind of like slow the roll. Yep. But anyway, it's, and, and I sat back and I was like, you know what? I don't know what anything is for. You're right. Humility, accountability, and then it's kind of like your own internal course correction. Okay, I don't want to do this again. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So. Absolutely. And, and it's a that presence of mind to recognize. Okay, something's going on here. Yeah. And importantly, at that point, that presence of mind. And I know myself in years gone by. This actually is a. This actually can be painful. When I talk about painful, like even just in the solar plexus or anxiety evoking, where if you've got to turn your view from, for example, I'm blaming Heather for how I feel at the moment. As soon as I turn there and go, no, I'm not, no, it's not Heather at all. It's actually me. That can actually be very, very uncomfortable. 
the ego within us all does not like that at all. The ego likes to blame and point the finger and keep the focus on everything around you. It likes excuses. It likes all those sorts of things. So presence of mind to go, you know what? It's not that person. What's happening with me? But importantly, love yourself. Don't berate yourself. Don't right. go, oh, you right. idiot. What did you do that for? So that moment with the Airbnb, you've got a deep breath. Yeah. Sit on it. It doesn't have to be solved right there and then. Let it pass and just see what comes out for you. That clarity moment. Let it flow. Allow it. Sit with it. I know it sounds crappy. Who wants to sit in a shitty feeling? But yeah. it's true. Let it happen. Yeah. Where it becomes a problem where you're sitting in those feelings day in, day out for weeks on end. That's not healthy. Right. Well, yeah. that's what even Dr. Joe Dispenza, uh, he describes as the refractory period. So let's say the emotion there was guilt or shame or anger. If you do need to feel it to heal it, but if you don't yep. express like it, <laughs> yeah, you feel it to heal it. Yep. If you don't express it and you suppress those emotions, they literally linger in your body, and and long term, those are what can create the dis ease in the body. Oh yes, so absolutely. We've got to. Oh, okay, that's a whole nother yeah. tangent. Here, <laughs> here's something I want to touch on with you because what you shared with me, I think this is so powerful. And I think a lot of people have, um, like, they don't quite understand ego and what ego is. And I want to hear your perception. But what I understand about it is that ego is that personal identity. But I want to hear more from you um, about the ego and what you shared with me is like the mind created self, little s. Yep. We do most definitely have a mind created self and it's much like, so our, think of it this way and mentioned earlier around Dr. Bruce Lipton, but when we are born and even that last trimester of pregnancy, we're absorbing things at that point from our mother. And it's been proven scientifically that a baby can hear a father's voice or the the, the siblings that might talk through mum's tummy and those sorts of things. So what is important to point out there, what's the environment that that child that unborn child is actually in is there a lot of unrest is there a lot of arguing is it loud is it is it argue you know all those sorts of things and then they come into the world in physical form literally like a blank slate so we have this spiritual self true self we have the mind created self which is ego self and then we have all that our primitive wiring and these are just three basic forms. Obviously, I'm no neuro neurologist and they've got a more complex way of explaining this, but that's the three basic areas that I observe. And the primal self is you're really not going to change that wiring too much. That's the one that kicks in the fight, fight or flight. But where that kicks in is where we control our thinking and controlling is probably a little bit of a strong word, but it's where you kind of have awareness of your thinking. And that thinking is the mind created self. So for me, I was sort of became an adult, a very, I guess, stressed and tense adult because it was about achieving and getting more money to then feel secure and feel free. So anything that we spent money on, I almost just lose my mind. It would just explode because I was so stressed about spending money. This is many years ago. So that was the belief I was holding. So beliefs in that ego created self are what we need to be aware of. Now, the truth of who you really are, who I am, is never criticism. It is never judgment. It is never uncertainty. It is never unease, anxiousness, worry. Our true self and our true spiritual alignment is just purely plain and simple. It's just feeling love and joy in all circumstances. That, yeah. I know it sounds way out of left field, yeah. and it is tricky to keep connected with that. And that's where breath work and those sorts of things can come into it. But that's the three elements, the primitive sort of side of our minds, the ego created or mind created self, and then our true selves. And now where I'm at, I can easily recognize when the ego's kicked in. So if I, we touched on before the trigger, someone said something, and usually it could be my wife because she's the closest to me and we love each other dearly. So that's where you, people listening, that's where likely most of your triggers will come from, those you're closest to. So something can be said every now and then and I'll just feel uneasy. I go, oh, like I, can, I just know that hurt the ego. And sometimes I'll re react and sometimes I just won't respond at all. Mostly I won't respond at all. But when I react, I know straight away I go, ah, ego. Yeah. Ego felt it. Ego's fired back mm -hmm. and gone, stuff you. 
you don't get to say that to me. That's your ego. Anybody listening, people listening, when you fire back, when you feel uneasy, when you feel worried, when you feel deflated, that's your ego trying to keep you stuck in a sense of worth that is low and it's in your comfort zone. So there's a lot in this one, Heather, like this is almost a whole episode or in around the ego and how we think, but in basic yeah. form, that's the three areas. Well, and how I've experienced it again with this current situation, anytime you feel if victimized, if you need to defend or justify, and again, you're going to feel it in your body. It really doesn't yeah. feel good. But it's because if we're always living in this love, joy, our natural state, which telling somebody in 3D, they're going to be like, that's so woo woo. But that's like our unconditional, that's our natural state. Yes. But if you're constantly in love, joy, gratitude, flow, ease, that would literally be death to the ego self. And it will fight, kick and scream. Oh, yeah. Because... (laughs) <laughs> I mean it's got a very 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 strong purpose and that is to hold on <laughs> yeah so I guess yeah, the, right. the only thing at the tip of the iceberg on on that level is just to know when it doesn't feel good that stress anxiety tension that's not the direction right that's maybe fear driven ego driven um, victimized whatever but when it's flow and ease and it's just happening and joy and like that's when you're quote in your zone of genius go that way right yeah and to build on that just a little when you have that anxiety feeling important to point out people and myself included used to be here we have that the wrong way around where i used to feel anxious about something it was to me it was accepted as normal that's okay mm-hmm. because i'm doing something out of my comfort zone oh, hang on a second what I can now recognize is that my mind, my ego self is trying to put across a message that this isn't going to work. Stay here. Like it, it's fighting about getting out of its comfort zone, especially if it's facing death, so to speak, around you're doing something that can help you feel joy. And your ego is not about joy. Your ego is about negativity. And you touched on that. So that feeling you get in your stomach is the discord. And this is something that Heather, um, Heather, Abraham Hicks speaks to is that that discord feeling, that uneasy feeling in your solar plexus or in your chest is almost like that tug of war or the conflict between what your ego is trying to say, which is negative versus what your soul wants for you, which is just nothing but love and joy. That is recognition. And that is where people become aware and their trigger point to go, Oh, hang on a second. I'm feeling anxious. My mind is telling me something negative, my ego self, but my heart wants this for me. So that'll then flow on to what you said, anything that's easy, anything that pops in your head like a good idea, that's it. That's all it's supposed to be. That's how easy it's supposed to be. Exactly that. We end up fighting ourselves and talking ourselves out of things or trying to find the errors and the problems and the risks in anything that we're going to do. That's your ego. And that tends to be supposedly statistics out there state that 80% of our daily thoughts are negative. So look even there. And And it's about 60,000 a day. (laughs) Right. And I've caught this in conversations that our initial instinct is to talk ourselves out of it. And I'm like, wait, why wouldn't we try to talk ourselves into greatness when that's what we're capable of? Exactly. And that's those beliefs and those thought patterns that kick in. And that's all our conditioning. And if you look at, uh, like, let's go back to the material thing. It's easy enough for people to relate to. You see people that are rich, materially speaking, and you see people are poor, materially speaking, they keep repeating the same sorts of things because that's their environment. That's what they believe to be true. And they don't believe anything else is possible beyond that. So those beliefs become so hardwired within that's why it's very very rare for that cycle of no money or being poor to get broken and that's why there's a lot of theories around let's not just hand money to for example the homeless let's actually pick them up help them and show them what they're worth empower them empower them through learning and what they're capable of and get them up on their feet to reskill or skill them up who knows what skills they do or do not have i don't know but So this is where it comes about of it's rather than just putting a Band-Aid on it, it's actually show them how to not to get hurt and change their beliefs. And and I understand there's mental health involved here and that's beyond definitely my scope of expertise. But just in basic form, 
the way we think, the way we condition think is, is what needs to change. And if we can change that through awareness first and foremost, then we can actually start living a better life and feel those good feeling thoughts that we think we're just going to get through money or promotion or otherwise. And importantly, don't dismiss money. Don't dismiss accomplishment and career progression at all. It's just about recognizing what's negative and where you feel good. Yeah. That's really important. Something I asked you earlier is what is a billboard message you want to share with humanity? Trust. Trust within. We've all got it within. Yeah. Now, this is wouldn't get expanded on in the billboard, but if you yeah. trust within, we're always looking outwards. I was the same. I was looking for approval, validation, feelings of significance from those around me, whether it be a boss getting another client and the client says, yes, I want to work with you, Kai. Well, yeah, I feel good. Feel good first. Focus on how you want to feel and the rest will actually just happen. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit because I couldn't yep. agree more. However, it's a yep. it's a paradigm shift. It's building that it trust muscle, the mindset muscle. It's very intentional and mindful. How mm. would you offer somebody to get started to start living from this essence of because I, I love this. I, I mean, many people say it, but I think one of the earliest I'm aware of is Neville Goddard. Yes. And I think he's like quoting from the Bible, right? As within, so without. That our external environment is simply a reflection of the internal state. That's yeah. why you don't go fix the external, <laughs> fix the internal, and the yes. external changes. Yes. Okay. So how do we build this trust innate muscle? It's that inner dialogue narrative that we've got going so uh, we've said it a few times awareness okay when are you actually destroying yourself with your own negative thinking that's simply it that is the foundation because if we let that run it's much the same as having someone follow you around every day and out of the sixty thousand thoughts you'd have they're giving you 80 percent of those was that forty thousand or something forty five thousand thoughts they're going to be saying to you every single day if that was actually a person following you around, I know myself, I'd probably be in jail. I would have killed them within the first day. Yeah. But we do it to ourselves yes. in our own thoughts. And it is hard, but it is most definitely worth it. So trust, be aware of your own negative thinking and start to then change it. So in the situation where you're going, I can't do it, just simply rephrase it into something soft and easy, which is, I'm okay, I'm going to give it a go. That's it. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to crush it and I'm going to take it and fuck fear and I'm going to get it done. It doesn't have to be so black and white. Yeah. Just ease into it and give it, allow time, trust that it takes time. Yeah. You could be 40 years of age, you spent 40 years thinking negatively, it's not going to change in a few months. It takes work. I'll be really upfront. It takes work. And if you really want massive change, it takes a lot of work, but thousand percent worth it. Absolutely. And possible. Okay. Here's, here's what I want to know. Can you paint a picture a few years ago, stressed out, anxious, negative money story, Kai versus doing the internal work, being mindful and intentional and shifting What's what's on the other side? The picture I, that came for me straight away when you asked that first part of the question was a canvas with a whole heap of mud thrown at it. Oh. Just a whole... <laughs> just, pile of just, shit. Just a pile of shit. And that is a, it's an exaggerated term, but that was more a reflection of how I was feeling. Looking back at my life, my life was actually quite good, but it was what I was... It was that inner dialogue. It was what I was doing to myself within... That was the shit. Yeah. Now there's so much clarity. Like it's like a the most crystal clear window you could ever look out of. And there's still little dots on that window that need cleaning. Yeah. But I can see a lot clearer now. And I and that's again with what I feel within. My life's perfect. It always has been. But I was just seeing it through two totally different lenses. lenses. Yes. Yep. I love that. Okay, here's what I want to ask you, because we touched on many different topics, subjects today. What do you believe is one key takeaway you want listeners to get? Do the work. You can change your beliefs and you can change your life. 
Yeah. No well said. And it really it really is that simple. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Read the books, listen to the Heather Hakes podcast, do that sort of stuff, but put it into practice. Hey, Don't just nice, listen and go on about your day. <laughs> nice plug there. You know what? On all of my solo episodes, I always, in all my YouTube videos, at the end of every single one, I say, okay, now go implement, do this thing. Yeah. Do not just passively listen to this. So, yes. Yes. And but even anyway. that, that little bit of passive where someone might be into it each and every day, it does play a role but <clears throat> again if heather says think positively in one of your videos and then you spend the rest of your day not thinking positively then that's not putting it into practice yeah. if she says think positively then you go practice awareness through the day and catch yourself out a few times in the day you're putting it into practice and that's what will yeah. end up creating the change yes all right i have a few questions i'd like to ask you to wrap up the interview far away what is a quote or motto that you live by I don't have one. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I just simply don't have one. I think it's just, if one comes to mind, it's just live life, be happy, and do the work it takes to get there. Yes. What is a book you're currently reading or highly recommend? One I've just about finished is called is Eckhart Tolle's Power, not Power of Now, um, A New Earth. Mm. And it was very coincidental. when I Often when I pick up a book, it's just, yeah, I'm going to read that one. Just feels right at the time, so I just pick it up, buy it, and and I didn't expect this out of his book, but it was a large part of ego, and I'm just reading it, going, "Oh my god, this is bang on. I've experienced this. I've done that. I've seen this. I've seen that." So, a new earth by Eckhart Tolle. Final question: What advice would you give your younger self? Uh. Straight away, I'm going back to a, a teenager self and I'm going, believe in yourself. Mm. Trust in your abilities. You have what it takes to be happy and live the life you want. Phenomenal note to end on. Kai, thank you so <laughs> much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me on, Heather. It was a beautiful chat. Loved it. Thank you. <laughs>